page that I have. Excuse me one moment. My name is Susan Parker. I don't need a prepared remarks to tell you that. Um, and I'm the deputy university librarian at the UCLA library. First of all, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of university librarian Gary Strong, who could not be here today. Uh, Gary and I and the entire library are really thrilled that you're here this afternoon for this talk by John Wilbanks. Um, I'd also like to, in addition to welcoming you, I'd like to provide some uh, recognitions and then I will introduce uh, Chris Borgman from the Department of Information Studies and she will introduce John. So first I'd like to acknowledge the collaboration that has made this event possible. Uh, thanks to all the co-sponsors, that's the Department of Information Studies, the School of Law, Institute of Digital Research, Academic Technology Services and of course the library. And uh, I will single out my assistant Leslie for making sure that we jumped on this opportunity as fast as it came across her desk as well as for the logistics here today and uh, for library staff who are, are taping this and uh, making it possible to, to archive. In addition, I will do a moment of commercial plugging for ourselves and say that the University Libraries Communications, Scholarly Communications Steering Committee hosts ongoing programming for faculty, students, and librarians on topics related to intellectual property, copyright, author's rights, and the use of copyrighted material for teaching and learning. So that's our little plug for ourselves. And then I would like to introduce Dr. Borgman. Uh, Chris Borgman is a researcher, scholar, activist, and advocate for transforming scholarly communications and ensuring the broadest possible dissemination of research and scholarship. Professor Borgman holds the Presidential Chair in Information Studies at UCLA. She is the author of more than 200 publications in the field of information studies, computer science, excuse me, and communication. Among her wide-ranging research interests is a focus on the underlying social and policy changes that she describes as profound and having lasting effects on the future scholarly environment. Both of her sole authored monographs, Scholarship in the Digital Age, Information, Infrastructure, and the Intranet, in the Internet, excuse me, and From Gutenberg to Global Information Structure, Access to Information in a Networked World, have won the Best Information Science Book in the Year Award from ACES. She is a lead investigator for the Center for Embedded Network Systems, or SENS, a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center, where she conducts data practices research. She's a member of the U.S. National Academy's Board on Research Data and Information and the U.S. National CoData, the Board of Directors of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Chris has received many accolades and awards, and most recently, I was privileged to be present when she received the 2011 Paul Evan Peters Award from the Coalition for Networked Information, the Association for Research Libraries, and EDUCAUSE. The library and I am lucky to have Chris as a colleague and a friend, and so now, Chris, I turn it over to you to introduce John. Thank you. All right, I'll just hold this. Um, John uh, Wilbanks has been a, a sort of a longtime co-conspirator in thinking about new ways of rebuilding scholarly communication, um, rebooting, jump-starting, skunk works, the various other things uh, that need to be done and need to be thought about uh, in the future and in, and in the present. Uh, as one of the founders of the Berkman Center for Law and Policy at Harvard, you might think he's a lawyer. As uh, the founding head of Science Commons, you might think he's a scientist by training. Um, he is neither, and both, and a lot of other things. Uh, he comes to us with a liberal arts background and someone who's been an uh, innovator and an entrepreneur in a number of areas. Uh, and he's been, I think, in our circle of thinking about new kinds of ways to use scholarship, certainly on the front of the open access movement, the kinds of research that we have been doing on the future of thinking about scientific data, scholarly data, including digital humanities data, very much depend on open access and on licensing, on different ways of partitioning, of managing digital information. 
And so it's conversations with him, with um, his colleague Jonathan Zittrain last week, still at the Berkman Center, and others that we have tried to get as broad a conversation, and why Susan and I and uh, Jerry Kong and others wanted to get a broad conversation on campus. And I know we have people here from Caltech, I think from USC, from a number of other places. Uh, we also, are, it's easier to get John now that he has moved Science Commons from MIT out to the Bay Area, to Silicon Valley, and folded it into the more mainstream of the Creative Commons enterprise, which I'm sure he will talk about also. And I think we will see yet more collaboration between UCLA, University of California, the West Coast universities around some of the Creative Commons and licensing issues. Uh, John also has uh, agreed to talk to our course on data, data practices, and data curation tomorrow morning. And as long as we got him down here, we thought we should uh, be nice and share him with the entire Southern California community. So that's enough to introduce our good colleague, John Wilbanks. Well, and this is uh, a Creative Commons license video, of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we don't really like to share stuff. <laughs> Um, so it's always nice to be down here and to see Chris. Um, so I, as she mentioned, I work at Creative Commons. I'm, this is not going to be a Creative Commons commercial. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. But um, Chris gave me the latitude to, to give a more sort of thinking kind of talk. And what I wanted to talk about is, is something that we've been noticing over the seven years that we've been doing Science Commons, which is that the way that we communicate in scholarship is really fragmenting from what we got used to. And what that means, both in terms of the fragmentation and then how you start to put Humpty Dumpty back together. Uh, but before then, um, so this is why I do what I do. It's my sister. Right? Uh, she has a, a very rare form of psoriatic arthritis. It's a very invasive psoriatic or rheumatoid arthritis. She had it since she was about four. And it's almost an immune disorder at this point. So that anytime anything remotely bad happens, if it could happen to anybody, it happens to my sister. And um, if we wanted to go to PubMed and read the papers about her illness, um, we would see typically, this is what you see when you go to PubMed, and you want to look for like Embril, because her doctors put her on Embril at one point. Uh, and you want to find out what are the therapeutic effects and what are the side effects. In particular, what are the rare cancers that come out of treatment with Embril when you treat arthritis? Um, because my sister actually developed a rare cancer as a side effect of taking Embril. She developed soft palate cancer on the roof of her mouth, which basically only uh, sort of old men who chew tobacco in the South, where we come from, um, get. Right? Women under 40 don't get this. Uh, and if you try to read the articles that are available, these are, and you're not at UCLA or at MIT, this is what she got. And this is what her doctor got, too. It wasn't just her as a patient, it was her physicians, her caregivers couldn't get access to this. And so if you run the numbers, right, there's 547, if we look for embryo and side effects in rheumatoid arthritis, at $20 an article, which is a actually conservative estimate, it's usually more like 30 to 40, um, it's about $11,000 to read all of the articles that are available. And you're not allowed to run those through any sort of processing system. I know enough people that if I could get those articles, I could probably run them through some basic text processing stuff and give a stack rank to her physician to look at. So um, this can be done better, and that's why I do what I do. Uh, I spent about 15 years in and around this space. Uh, my other sister's autistic, so we don't have great genes, and I'm kind of worried about it, right? <laughs> Um, and I have this deep belief that if we can share information better and make information more useful, that we can actually fix some of these problems, that the answers are actually latent in the system, but we've been unable to make the connections so far. So that's, that's why I'm here. Okay, so the actual talk, right, is, is starts with this observation that the network starts to rip apart content that used to be integrated by virtue of its medium. And so before we get into communications, right, I am old enough to have started out my music collection on vinyl, right? And so music is something that was integrated by virtue of its physical medium. I didn't buy albums because I wanted to buy the albums. Often I bought them because there was one song on them that I really wanted. I didn't have any choice, right? The unit of sale was the album. And if you were around during the transition to the compact disc era, you recall they first started coming out in these long paper boxes or plastic containers. That was so that they would fit into the racks that were the same size as the vinyl records. 
because the whole music industry is based on the idea of distribution of a physical medium, right, that couldn't be disintermediated. It couldn't be ripped apart because it cost a lot to make these things, whether they were vinyl or plastic. It cost a lot to ship them around. It cost a lot to maintain inventory and sales staff. But as we got closer and closer towards a fully digital medium, right, consumers started to rip apart the CD and say, you know what, we'd rather buy songs. I don't want to buy seven songs I don't like to get one song that I do. And so you start to see actual data. So this is 2011 uh, recorded music revenues. Um, the blue line is album downloads, and a lot of that is driven by the fact that Apple will force you to buy the whole album to get certain songs, especially popular songs. Uh, mobile is the red line. It's actually interesting to see how much it's dropped, but the, the purple line is the download of singles. And so what you see is this sort of steady growth, which is that the music industry is fragmenting away from this physical medium of the album, and it's moving towards the more natural unit of music distribution, which is the song. Right? That's the atom of music in many ways. Um, and we can argue about remix and all sorts of other systems, but the, my, my general point is that for, for people who are not remix musicians or samplers, right, the natural sort of atomic unit is the song, and we've ripped it apart now from the physical medium. And this is per capita, right, sales of singles. And what you can see is what digital did to the per capita consumption of singles compared to, remember, anyone remember singles, right? Those never really took off. Uh, but the fact that you could keep all these things in an iPod and carry a jukebox around really unbundled it from the physical medium. And the same thing is starting to happen to video as well. So this is a great video um, of a kid in Africa whose favorite movie is Commando by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he's memorized the entire movie. And so what you've got is this kid narrating the way that the movie sort of gets him out of his day-to-day -day life in his village with actual cuts from this you know, big, dumb action movie from the 80s. And so video is starting to be unbundled from you know, the film, the cassette, the VHS, the DVD, the Blu-ray, whatever physical medium that the movie industry wants to come out with to make you buy the most recent version of Blade Runner. Right, now you can start to actually take that and mix it up because the natural unit of video tends to be a lot shorter. The very few videos on YouTube run to two hours. So long form films are probably the exception to the way that we deal with video. And now I can watch YouTube on my TV at home. So it's starting to, again, be unbundled from that medium that gave it a certain size. It can now be repurposed. And if you look at the industries that have been transformed by this, right, books have been transformed by this, newspapers, um, music, being social, finding a job, advertising, right, this unbundling of things from the medium. right. Classified ads being unbundled from the newspaper by Craigslist. Right? Books being unbundled from the page by Amazon so that I can go to the 99 cent store on Amazon before I get onto a plane and buy six books for $6, right? which I could never have done at a bookstore very easily. I'd have to buy like, the old worst used books to get after that. Um, all these things have sort of been unbundled now from the physical. And, and that's because of common network design. Right. No one who was involved in the design of the internet foresaw the rise of Craigslist as a place uh, to sell your old furniture, buy drugs, uh, find a couch to surf on, any of the various things that you can do on Craigslist. Uh, nor did they envision eBay, nor did they envision email, but it was all possible because the network didn't forbid any of that in advance. Right. That's what's allowed this sort of unbundling. Uh, so why hasn't this happened in scholarly communication to date? So we still think about scholarship as a fairly physical set of objects transformed into the digital world. Journals still have issues that have pages and volumes, right? It's amazing how people still think about getting into production deadlines for journals in a digital world, even though the vast majority of those are going to be sent out electronically. So we made a list once over beer of things that haven't been transformed and we, would just, we were using sort of framework of Eisenhower's military industrial complex, right, the iron triangles. And uh, we came up with, with these five uh, industrial complexes that had avoided the same sort of transformation. And what they all have in common is that they're all institution-centric. And so unlike music, unlike newspapers, unlike being social, unlike finding a job, unlike advertising, there are these institutions, right, we're in one right now, um, that actively create inertia, 
which is a strange phrase, but I, I like it, um, that prevents this sort of disruption from happening. So for me to get tenure at a place like UCLA, which wouldn't happen because I have a PhD, but for me to get tenure at a place like UCLA, I'd have to have a bunch of citations in high impact journals, which are subscribed to by the library, which is funded by overhead out of grants, right? which is a system that's very hard for individuals to opt out of, rationally or economically. So it's very difficult for me as an individual to say, you know what, I'm just not going to publish anymore in journals. I'm just going to blog. Because I won't get any citations. People might take my ideas and write papers and get citations. I won't get any grants. Right? I don't have any incentives to opt out. And it's the same thing in the life sciences as it is in the information sciences as it is in anthropology as it is in philosophy. You have to get a citation. And the format of those citations themselves is inherently a physical thing. Right? The journal name, the year, and so forth. And, and that's just what institutions do. It's not because institutions are evil. Institutions are meant to endure for a really long time. They're meant to resist fads. Right? In, in the life sciences or in the hard sciences, this is how you prevent um, intelligent design or cold fusion from leaking through. But what it's doing is actively resisting the disruption that the network brings to the consumer industries, where you don't have these institutions resisting the change. Um, now, the solution in these cases, and this is a picture of Eben Moglen. He's uh, very famous in the free software community as the lawyer who wrote the first legally sound version of the GNU General Public License, or GPL. He was the counsel for the Free Software Foundation for many years. And he came up with what he calls uh, his corollary to Ohm's law of resistance. And the idea is that if you wrap the planet in internet and spin it, software and culture comes down the wires. Because it's actually an emergent property of human beings that they like to share stuff with each other. That they take joy in creating things and sharing with, it, with each other. At least for a certain number of us. And so the question isn't what's the incentive for any one person to share stuff, but what's the resistance in the wire? And he posits that the resistance in this system is the field strength of intellectual property. Because as a default setting, it creates a system in which transferring creative works or software is implicitly not allowed. And his whole answer to this is you resist the resistance. And what we can say after 10 years of Creative Commons is that for at least some percentage of the population, resisting the resistance, right, opting out of the, uh, of the default IP system is actually an emergent property of the network. Um, there are, at this point, somewhere near a billion objects on the web under Creative Commons licenses. There's 200 million photographs at Flickr alone as of this month under Creative Commons licenses. Right? Free software, despite all economic predictions to the contrary, works. Right? Wikipedia exists. And if you'd asked me 15 years ago, uh, when I started really dealing with the network, you know, wh what were the most likely outcomes in 15 years? You know, one, a global operating system that's for free that's, that has replaced IBM's proprietary server technologies. Right? Two, a global free encyclopedia uh, that has uh, outplaced Encyclopedia Britannica. Or three, that we would have open science and education. I would have said three. Right? But we've got free software and we've got Wikipedia, but we don't have open science and open education. So it's these institutions that the individuals sit inside that prevent this that in many cases is the problem. And that's where you have to do some culture jamming. And that's where I got to know Christine. But the good news is that uh, even institutions can't resist change forever. So this is an example from Open Education. It's a company. They just raised, I think, 15 million uh, last month in venture capital to give textbooks away. The idea being that if you can recreate a textbook by going to Wikipedia and filling in the contents from an existing table of contents using unambiguously open content, then the textbook is something that you give away as a loss leader. What's interesting is what people add to it. You can begin to track the graph that says, Christine in teaching added the following nine pieces of content to, to the scaffold, which is the textbook. Right? And John added seven of the same items. Maybe they should talk. You can look at students and say, what videos are you dragging and dropping into the scaffold that is your textbook? Because if we had bought and printed these textbooks, they wouldn't know that Osama bin Laden was dead. They wouldn't know that there had been revolution in North Africa. They'd be printed and sitting in 
a warehouse waiting for distribution to the students in September when they're completely out of date. So institutions, in particular tax-paying and funding institutions, are starting to force this sort of change in. So California and Texas, odd couple, have both decided that it's in their best interest as tax-paying institutions to buy the copyrights to the textbooks they pay for so they have the right to update them and print new copies whenever they want to. So here's an example of an institutional complex that's beginning to be disrupted much like the, um, the, the music industry was because it's no longer about the physical artifact of the book, it's about the table of contents and the graph that relates people who add content to the book together. Same thing is happening in, in journal publishing, especially in the life sciences. So the Public Library of Science, which started as a, what I would call a traditional digital publisher in 2002 or so, they put out some nice um, high impact traditional printed journals. Um, and then they weren't making very much money on it. Right? Even as a nonprofit, they were losing money. So they started an all digital journal called PLOS One. And the idea was rapid turnaround. We're not going to figure out whether or not any article is impactful or not. And we'll let that emerge afterwards. So they, they, did was, they came up with these changes, what they call article level metrics. Because PLOS One isn't a journal in any traditional sense. It doesn't have any volumes. It doesn't have any print runs. It doesn't have any deadlines. You submit whenever you've got an article. They review it as fast as they can. And it goes online as fast as it can be put online. And what's interesting is how many times did it get downloaded? How many conversations erupted around it? How many times is it referenced in the press? How many comments were left? How highly was it rated? In addition to citations, right? You're not getting rid of the traditional citations. You're recognizing that the citation's always been a one-dimensional way to measure the impact of an article, but it happened to be the one that we could track because it was tied to the physical medium of the paper. But once you put it onto the web, you can get all of these different ways to measure impact. Right, you get these changes in peer review style. So PLOS One, when it came out, was derided. It's a bulk publisher of junk science. No one's ever going to use it. It is the third largest publisher by volume in the United States now, three years after it launched, by the way. Um, and Nature has come out with a competitor as of two months ago, which is the best possible complement you can get. It's called Scientific Reports. Uh, they do better marketing because they're a company. Uh, so you can see all of the benefits of ripping apart the old peer review style, which is that it's now fast, rigorous, it's open, it's visible. And the point is not whether or not an article is substantive or impactful, but whether or not the science is valid. Everything else can emerge afterwards. But that's only possible when you unbundle the article from the medium of the journal. Because if you've got to print it and mail it to people, then I have to really tightly edit the words that I use because I've got a 500 word limit for four years of research because it costs every word that I print. Whereas now the you know, marginal cost of giving you 200 pages of annotations of the protocols that I used is zero. So now I don't have any page length restrictions. We don't have any of these costs that were associated with the medium of printing it out and mailing it to people. You have changes in the actual publishable object themselves. <clears throat> so this is research blogging. It's a group of people who post blogs about peer-reviewed objects. These are now turning into peer-reviewed objects themselves. This is Open Network Biology. It's a journal I helped start with a couple of scientists. Uh, we started it last month, actually. Um, it's going to accept software and data uh, as first order research objects alongside papers. The idea being that uh, if you want people to share data or share software, um, you can either try to invent new kinds of citations, which I'm also interested in doing, uh, or you can hack the existing publication system and say, we can give you a citation that looks just like a paper citation because you've published that article in a journal. That data set has been peer reviewed. Right? The software model that turns that data into knowledge has been peer reviewed and it now gets a citation that a, t that a review board uh, or a funding committee can look at just the way they look at a paper citation. And everything is under an open access license here. The article, the metadata, the software, all of that stuff. Um, this is called nano publications. Right? This is the idea that when you write a paper actually you spend at least half of the time in the paper proving that you know what you're talking about by recapitulating the existing canon to demonstrate that the one or two things that are new that you've come up with are not bullshit. So the idea is rather than doing all of that, you sort of assume that the model has been fully laid out and you only publish the assertions that you're making that are novel and the evidence for those things. The concepts, the actual semantic triples, 
the verbal statements, annotations, references back into evidence, data, other articles, all of those can be rendered in machine-readable, computable formats. Um, I used to really be into this. I studied formal semantics. And so this is really attractive if you've ever been uh, in epistemology graduate seminars. Um, but unless this gets automated, I am skeptical uh, that people will actually start writing in tuples, um, as much as many of us might prefer it. Uh, and this is another version, scholarly HTML. So this is the idea that we can have extensions to HTML that are scholarly specific. Um, Chris actually sent me this email, which is the idea of digital quantum pricing as article charges in astronomy. Right, so everywhere you look, this idea that, that we publish in journals that get printed and mailed to libraries, which keep them on acid-free paper and cold storage, and that's the scholarly record. That's the way we communicate knowledge, and that's the way we store it, that's the way we preserve it. This is really fragmenting as it gets into digital space. But it's not like music, where we have a natural atomic unit, which is the song. Right, we don't know if the atomic unit of scholarship is the article, or the blog post, or the tweet or the nano publication, or the scholarly HTML, right? There's a million people asking to get a million projects funded who all think they have the answer to this, right? But nobody's really cracked it yet. And we're actually changing the way we collaborate now as well. Um, I've been working with a group that's trying to get lots and lots of life sciences laboratories to work together, virtually. So data that gets made in one lab uh, in, in, at UCSF gets shared with a lab down here at UCLA, gets shared with a lab over in Harvard. And what we're finding is that it's really hard for labs to use data that somebody else made, even if it's been well annotated. And the, the reason I've got this up here is that in one of the phone calls where the frustration was being expressed, that one of the guys said, listen, in our lab we have a clock gene. Right? We have a circadian rhythm as a laboratory that comes from having coffee together, that comes from having journal club together, that comes from yelling at each other and competing for reagents. And when you don't have that, it's very hard to understand all the assumptions that went into a given data set. And when you're dealing with knowledge and communication at the paper level, you don't have to worry about that, because it's all about whether or not you got the language right. But when you think about all of the stuff that went into that paper and trying to expose that, making those pieces of the communication, it gets really hard. Um, and then at the same time, you see the eruption of startup companies that are trying to build on open access, like Mendeley, which is basically iTunes for your um, uh, paper library. You keep all your papers in one folder, right? You show Mendeley that folder, and Mendeley tells you other people who are like you and what they're reading. So unlike all of the other attempts to make Facebook for science, which were basically um, ignorant of the fact that Facebook A exists and B is free, and C, scientists can join it, recognize that Facebook for Science is about the things that scientists are reading. It's not about the scientists as social beings. It's about scientists in the practice of the knowledge that they're looking for. And so uh, although I've spent seven years in this space arguing about copyright and sort of, it's all about these pre-fragmentation forms. It's all about the journal, right? The title, the article. Um, and, and this is all I can think of, right? <laughs> It's just obsession over a world that's already basically gone. Now, the institutions are going to take a while to catch up to this, the funding institutions, the tenure institutions. You know, but inevitably, thinking about publishing as something that is tied to journals and articles as the primary units of scholarly communication, it's done because the fragmentation is already happening. And then the real question becomes, Right. If you're going to be disintermediated, right, if you're going to be resisted, how do you start to put it all back together so we can do something interesting with it? Because a lot of the people who are out there arguing for ripping apart peer review, ripping apart journals into articles, ripping apart articles into nano publications, ripping apart nano publications into tweets, what have you, um, ignore the fact that it's really, really hard to put it all back together and do something interesting. Right? It actually used to be fairly easy. Right? You went to the library. And whatever was in the library was what you knew. Right? Maybe you found some references to things that weren't in the library, and that's when you would call interlibrary loan and have it sent over. But you had a tractable universe, especially if you could read quickly. And the reintegration took place in your brain. But now if we're going to start ripping apart everything, we have to come up with some ways to stitch it all back together. And the, the, da the danger here is that there are a set of resistors 
to putting it back together. One is copyright. Um, copyright can prevent us from indexing articles for all of those things that are inside them. It can prevent us from copying large corpuses of articles so we can do processing on them. It can prevent us from copying databases so that we can do interesting things with the databases. Um, in many cases, I think the importance of the, that the burden of copyright over the long term is probably overstated compared to other forms of culture on, on scientific communication. Um, because the payers are primarily public, I think there's a very good chance that over time these, these works are not going to be uh, serious problems with copyright. But for today, it is a problem. And it is a problem in particular on the back archive that we're going to have to deal with. Um, you have to have policies. This is the NIH public access policy. It totally ignores copyright. It basically says if you take money from the NIH to write a paper, you've got to give the NIH a copy of that paper to put onto the web within 12 months. So now you've got a policy that is sort of backing up and, and acting against the resistors. The NSF is now requiring data management plans to be submitted. No one really knows what such a thing looks like, as far as I can tell. Um, we, we've, we've asked a lot, and I don't mean to, to, to bash on the NSF for this, but as far as I can tell, your data management plan can be that I don't plan to manage my data. Right? That is a data management plan. Um, and we don't have guidelines for what represents an acceptable data management plan. We don't have guidelines for, for, to understand as a review committee how important a data management plan is, how that should affect whether or not we give a grant to group A or group B. Right? Um, but these policies are coming into place because they recognize that reassembling the fragments after they've been blown apart by the digital revolution are really hard. And so we have to start thinking about them at the moment we fund the research, not afterwards, because otherwise it's going to be impossible to put the egg back together. Um, and the big elephant in the room in the sciences is privacy. This is often, uh, this is the biggest in, in health, but you find this in almost anything that touches on people, which is that if you don't deal with privacy before you start your research, you often are unable to reassemble the fragments. Uh, so this is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, for lack of a better word. The idea is to protect you as a patient from getting screwed because someone gets access to your data. Uh, but the reality of it is that it now makes it very hard for you to participate as an individual in a patient-driven study or as a researcher to share data with other researchers in a way that would allow you to aggregate and integrate that knowledge to generate new knowledge. And it's, it's what Merton might have called the unintended consequences of a purposeful, purposive social action. Right? That's the impact of copyright. Copyright wasn't designed to block the flow of scholarly knowledge. Right, the, the various uh, policy responses to people not sharing data or not sharing their articles um, you know, were, were created as reactions to um, the unintended consequences of copyright, the unintended consequences of scientific communication. Um, and we're going to have to have something that deals with the unintended consequences of privacy law. Um, we're also seeing an explosion in the atomic papers being submitted now. So this is the uptick in papers submitted to PubMed. Uh, starting in 05 over here and ending in uh, late 2010. Uh, and the, these are in the thousands. So you start to see a spike in the total number of papers as well. So now even if you had access to all the papers, you don't have time to read them all. Nobody can read 8,000 papers a month. So we need new ways to actually analyze and process and deal with those. Right? So even if they don't fragment beyond the paper, putting together and integrating that information is, is, is nearly impossible. And the way that technologists want to do with this is to read papers and figure out those key statements and assemble them into graphs. So this is from a company uh, called Selventa. They bought my company nine years ago. And, and this is what they do, right? They assemble graphs out of papers. Um, this is ignoring the fact that the papers we choose to fund are totally biased by politics, policy, experience, and review groups. So we have a, uh, even, even when we do this, we get a biased view out of it. But this is the beginning of an attempt to reintegrate the information that's been fragmented. Uh, the big problem is that the vast majority of copyright license and transfer agreements, including the ones signed by the University of California Digital Libraries, make it illegal to do this. You waive the right to do this in return for the copyright licenses um, to the underlying literature. So this is a place, again, where the, the integration of these things makes, so the integration of the controls makes it hard to reintegrate the knowledge. 
Um, and that's just the papers. So this is an example of some database explosions. This is from 2011 nucleic acids research. They count uh, 1,330 databases publicly funded just in molecular biology and nucleic acids. Uh, the vast majority of these were not designed to talk to each other, so you can't query them from a common interface. Uh, we don't have anything like CGI bin for databases, so we can't stitch them together and do anything common about them. And if you wanted to ask a question, like a scientist would want to ask, it would say, get me a list of all of the genes that are in a certain kind of brain cell that have a certain kind of function, because I'm curious about potential drug targets for Alzheimer's disease. You'd have to spend two or three weeks writing Perl scripts, sort of hacking around in the literature, hacking around in five or six different databases to do that. And so we did a Skunk Works project to try to address this. We had to go and integrate about 150 different data sources, ontologies, and systems to get to where you could actually write a query that would answer that question in a replicatable way. So this is, this is, this is actually query code. So what you see here is actually this is the, um, the kind of gene it is, this little identifier. And we have down here an identifier for um, the kind of cell it's in. And it's like HTML was in the mid-90s when I started writing it. Um, this is a stable query. So anyone else that wanted to write it about a different kind of cell and a different kind of gene would just have to change the identifiers. right? So you can copy and paste and start writing complicated queries that integrate across these databases. But to do this took five people three years. Right, to build the infrastructure to do this took five really expensive people three years. Um, we had to invent a naming system for the entities that were inside databases because the domain name system was designed for documents, not for entities inside databases. We had to actually invent a domain name system for data along the way. We had to write scrapers for all of these different data sources along the way, validate them. We had to invent a piece of software that assembled all of them into a single graph. Then we had to work on all of the systems that would actually make it run on the web. And if you have spent any time in technology, you would know that whenever someone gives you a how-to file that's in raw text and it starts off with, this is really hard to do, you should be scared, right? So uh, you can't quite see it's cut off, but the, the, it says a running mirror consumes a fair amount of systems resources. Right? And when a, when a guy in his 50s with a ponytail writes that sentence, you should believe it um, at MIT. You need to spend about $10,000 on your server just to run a mirror of this. So the infrastructure to start stitching and integrating this stuff together doesn't exist yet. You've got to have people with incredibly arcane expertise who are highly competed for in the job market. Right? You've got to pay them almost at a corporate level. And it still takes you several years. Um, the good news is now that the server that we've got running um, is now getting 50,000 of these structured queries a day from, from the world, despite no advertising uh, and, and no real knowledge that it's out there, and a very small user base. So there is a demand for these sorts of things if you can get them to the, pers to the point where all you have to do is edit the query. In much the same way that if you had to set up your own web server, you wouldn't put up a website. But once you could scrape someone else's HTML and just change what was inside the tags, you might be willing to put a website up. And indeed, that's how the web grew in its early days. And perhaps the greatest compliment is that the pharmaceutical industry has formed a complex alliance called the Pistoia Alliance. They launched theirs at a meeting in a very beautiful town in Italy. Uh, we launched ours around a bar table in Cambridge. Um, to, to replicate precisely this problem. And so we certainly invite them uh, to take all of our code, since everything we've done is open source, and, uh, and we welcome them to the party, even if they're late. Um, but all of this so far has been about institutional stuff and institutional research. Um, the thing that's changing right now that's most exciting to me is that we're now getting the capacity to generate data about ourselves um, that's very similar to the capacity we got in the late 90s to capture creative works through digital cameras and videos. So this is my, my son, Noah. Hey, Noah. Hey. He's eight weeks old. Um, and I mentioned my sister early on, right? So I'm worried that he might have a tendency towards arthritis or autism. And from my own genetic profile, right, this is actually from my personal genetic profile. I'm you know, going to show you a piece of it. Um, I have a very high chance to develop psoriasis. I'm actually 2x genetically the normal tendency to develop psoriasis compared to men of my ancestry. 
So I can actually get this data. This cost me $100, plus I paid 10 bucks a month to get updated results coming out. Uh, we're going to get Noah's genetic results in about six weeks, so we'll know whether or not he carries the gene. So now we can start to capture data about ourselves, and the question is, this is going to further fragment the data space. Right? I can capture my own data. I can start writing my own experiences. I can capture a log of whether or not the shampoos I use affect whether or not I have psoriasis, whether or not a medicine I'm taking works or not. So now we can participate as persons in the research process in a way that was frozen out to us, just the way we can now participate in a cultural process. But what this does is make the reintegration even harder. Because at least when you were dealing with databases and institutions, you were dealing with people who know how to deal with each other, even if slowly. Right? UCLA knows how to work with USC. Right? They might not want to, and they might not, but they know at least in theory how to do it. I got a great laugh out of you out of that. <laughs> how does USC or how does UCLA deal with 10,000 people who want to share their genomes? And how do we start to assemble and get meaning out of that? Um, one of the first attempts to do this is called the Personal Genome Project. This is coming out of Harvard. This is going to be 100,000 people's full sequence genomes, right, on the web, in the public domain, with a complete health interview, can't be their health record, but a complete health interview, as well as a line of stem cells available from a stem cell bank, right? All of the data is under a CC0 public domain tool. All the lines of stem cells are under a Creative Commons materials transfer agreement. If you find someone's genome that's interesting to you and they've got the clinical profile that's interesting, one click, $70, and in 48 hours you'll have the stem cells in your laboratory to start doing research with. Right. How do we integrate this into the existing research enterprise? Right. Sage Bionetworks. This is uh, a group I'm involved in. I'm on the board. Um, this was Merck's disease biology group. Mer Merck is really not in the business of finding drugs anymore. Merck is in the business of buying drugs from other people who have already found them. Um, they took their disease biology group and basically gave it away to a nonprofit organization, which is called Sage. The idea behind Sage is, we want to take giant data sets about people, about individual people. We want to know their genetic variation. We want to know their clinical data. Like for me, I have high cholesterol also. I'm, I'm giving away a lot of information here. Uh, my, trust me, everyone who wants to know this about me in the insurance industry already does. Um, so we would take the fact that I have certain lipid measurements. We would take certain liver measurements about me. And then we would take a little sample of blood and measure what my genes are doing in reaction to taking Lipitor. And what we can get, if we get 100 people like me, we can get a graph of the genes that predict whether or not I'm going to respond well to Lipitor or whether I should take a different statin for my cholesterol management. We'll be able to figure out which one in four people are actually going to respond positively to a cancer drug. Because it turns out when you start from the data up, when you sort of ignore the literature and you start purely from the genetic data up, right, you actually defeat a lot of noise and you can begin to predict fairly accurately why a person is getting sick or why a person will respond or won't respond to a drug. So they create, they call these globally coherent data sets where you've got the genomic variation, the clinical information, and the gene expression, and then they integrate this into a software-based model that says, here are the genes that predict the behavior. Now, copyright isn't the problem here, but privacy and informed consent absolutely is. Um, and there's going to have to be some sort of process. This is what we've come up with as a mock-up is, you know, if I decide I want to put my data into this because I want to understand psoriasis or arthritis or autism or any of the diseases that my family might have in them, that I need to know that I'm granting people rights to do research with my data, rights to redistribute my data, to publish the, re the, the results, and to commercialize products that, that are derived from the research. But I want to impose some obligations. I want to make sure nobody re-identifies me so they can screw me out of insurance, right? especially life insurance, or deny my children insurance. Um, I don't want people doing research uh, for non-health purposes. There's all sorts of non-health things that you might do. You might decide to try to grow new body parts for cosmetic purposes out of my stem cells, and I might not want to allow that. But believe it or not, people are trying to do this. Right? There's applications of inkjet printers and 3D printing that are beginning to leverage cellular technology, and the hope is to begin to be able to print organs. Maybe I don't want to let that happen. I just want diseases to be uh, investigated. Um, or I don't want you to be able to take my DNA and place me at a crime scene. Right? Um, 
all of those things are possible. I, I don't have it in this presentation, but if you go on eBay, you can get a, synthesi a gene sequencer mailed to your house for $1,000 uh, from the secondary biotech appliance market. And the synthesis of genes is now about 30 cents a base pair at mrgene.com, uh, which is my favorite such place. All right, so again, fragment everything that we did that was institutional is fragmenting now. Uh, and you are probably going to, if you're going to actually do this, you're probably going to have to watch a video right, and click yes, because giving your consent to something isn't like doing a copyright license. It's a process, not a document. You have to demonstrate that you've been informed when you've made these choices. Um, and these systems don't exist yet, but they need to exist if we're going to be able to assemble the data that comes out the back end. Because otherwise, any given researcher is going to have to look at the world and say, I can't use that. I can't integrate that. Because I might trigger a privacy obligation. I might trigger a copyright claim. Uh, I might eventually want to start a company, and I'm building on non-commercial content. So if you don't have these unambiguous permissions, you just can't get it done. You can't even begin to reintegrate. So the idea is that, that all the innovation starts with permissions granted in advance, because then, right, at a minimum, all you have to do is figure out the technical part. Right? And that's hard enough. But if you have to figure out the technical, the legal, and the privacy, you're never going to get it done. And that's really what a commons is about. It's about putting these public pathways in place at the beginning of research so that you've imposed the minimum burdens on reintegration possible. I don't know if it's going to be nano publication or blogging or tweeting or scholarly HTML, and I frankly don't care. Right? We didn't know it was going to come out of HyperCard or the other hypertech systems in the late 80s. We didn't know it was going to become the web. Uh, what we wanted was a big open network that made innovation happen, and that came from an open system. So that's what we do at CC. As I said, I'm not going to do too much of an advertisement for us. But the thesis is that if you make the sharing happen at the beginning, then you can be pleasantly surprised by how people start reintegrating and remixing things at the back end. So what we try to do is to make it simple to share complicated things. We're probably best known for the copyright licenses. We've done a lot of other stuff. I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk more about those tomorrow. But by creating a simple and constrained set of options for licensing and copyright, you create a universe for remix. Right, for reintegration that wouldn't be possible in the absence of these affirmative grants. And we've seen this explosion in the adoption of the tools. This is through 2009. Um, we've actually, it's gotten so big that we can't effectively count anymore. Um, one of the things we're going to be uh, asking Chris and others for help for is to think about how do we count better? Um, and this is only the things that get posted. We can't track the, the works that are derived from these works yet. We can't track the downstream impact of having these works be shared. Um, and we operate at these multiple layers. We have a legal layer. We have a technical layer because we implement all of our licenses in metadata. We operate across science, culture, and education because we think that in all of these spaces, the, the fragmentation and reintegration is happening in its own way at its own pace. And if we can get one network that connects all of these, then the odds that we can connect an open journal system to an open textbook system we can connect an open photograph system to an open journal system, those odds go up, as opposed to having different networks for each of these three. Right? What we don't want is the AOL prodigy CompuServe problem of the late 80s, when you couldn't send email from AOL to CompuServe. We don't want to see that happen between culture and education and science. Because science and education and culture ought to be part of the same thing. Wikipedia is a good example of this. It's basically a complex adaptive system that's built on a standard technology platform and standard licenses. And even though no one designed it for that, it's been converted into a structured semantic database called DBpedia, which contains all of the semantic relationships inside Wikipedia reformatted. Right? Nothing was in there to prevent that sort of reuse or the reintegration of that content into a different format. So you know, coming back to this, right? this is really the goal. And the point of the talk, which is that we have these ways we communicate that were inherently paper-based. They were bound to the medium in which we communicated scholarship. And they're getting ripped apart. And if we don't get the legal permissions right, we're never going to be able to get the technology right that lets us stitch Humpty Dumpty back together. And it's really not about just having consumers in the center, because we have these powers as consumers. But it's about doctors, patients, scientists, teacher, teachers, students right, being in the center of the conversation. And that's something that the commons lets us do. So 
Um, I'm almost done, uh, but I always like to say at the end, right, what do I want you to do? And the idea here is to design from the beginning for reintegration. Because what, the only things we know unambiguously is that the fragmentation is happening and that we don't know how to do the reintegration. Right? We can say pretty cleanly that those two things are true. And since we don't know how the reintegration is going to happen, we have to design for unexpected ways that things will get reintegrated. So one is, when you publish, publish via open access. Right? If you can't publish an open access journal, make sure you work with the library to get a copy of your paper into the institutional repository. Right? Libraries are here to help you do that. And far too many scholars don't take advantage of that fact. They think of the library as a place where they get access to Scopus or to other sorts of systems. But the library is a place for you to post your scholarship, not just a place to read other people's stuff. Right? Second is, when you create data, and data can be anything. Data can be photographs. Right? I have a friend who is turning Facebook photographs into alcohol epidemiology data because he's looking for red solo plastic cups in photographs posted after midnight. Because that correlates really strongly to college students who abuse alcohol. Anything can be data. So think about data management plans for anything you create, because someone can come along and turn it into data. And again, your library can help you with that. Right? This is, again, if I can emphasize anything, I love the libraries. Right? Science Commons has been inside the MIT libraries for the last couple of years. I'm a, I'm a home teamer for the libraries. But the reality is, as we move into a data-rich world, as we move into a fragmented world, the librarian is going to become a key element of the data science team. Um, and building the commons into the infrastructure that you have at the library, not just the physical aspect of the library, but the digital aspect of the library, right? systems that make it easy to give permission in advance, connections to these processes that help researchers manage privacy, manage copyright, manage contract. Right? Building that into the social infrastructure of scholarship is going to be probably the most important thing we can do. Uh, and with that, I will stop. Uh, thanks again, Chris, and thanks to the library for hosting. And uh, we have plenty of time for questions, and there's lots of cookies if you want to take a break. Thank you. Right, so, so for the recording, the question was not about the Privacy Act, but about other legislation like the Patriot Act in the US. Uh, so there are, the Patriot Act's a great example, right? So there, there are many countries that will not allow genomic data related to their individuals into US government databases of genomic data, even those that are behind firewalls, because the Patriot Act allows a backdoor to re-identify those individuals. This is another place. It's an unintended consequence of, of social action in a totally different space. And uh, it's unfortunately something that, that you can find a lot of examples of. But it's a, it's a great point. Right. So the, the question is on. Um, the importance of default rules or the, or the feasibility of choosing to go after individuals versus default rules. You know, I, I was on the PubMed Central Advisory Board when it flipped from a request to a requirement. And the deposit rates, I think, spiked from 2.5% to something like 65%. So I think I've, I would have to say that I have a pretty strong bias for good default rules. Um, we were at MIT when the MIT faculty policy went through. Um, I watched pretty closely as Harvard put their policy in place. I think that, that it's, it's far more likely that if you put an incentive system in place at the institutional and funder level that you will see change in individual behavior um, than by a sort of a spark and a revolution that comes from giving talks, uh, even though I enjoy giving talks. Uh, the main reason I give them is to try to convince people to change their institutions. So we know when I come to a place like UCLA, my goal is, is not to get you to go out and get five of your law school colleagues to start radically publishing open access. It's that maybe one person will decide that they're going to go after or join a coalition that's trying to get a campus mandate in. Because that's what I've seen work. Um, my strong bias is uh, to create d strong default rules that are easy to opt out of. Because the system we have right now is a strong default rule against making things open, and it's hard to opt out if you want to share. I would far prefer that we flip it to say, by default, you share everything, 
right? But it's easy to opt out if you want to. And then each discipline can decide whether or not a given opt out was appropriate. And the Harvard mandate is, uh, on, on papers is actually a good example. Um, the default is you, you know, Harvard takes a, uh, basically a joint copyright or a, li a license ahead of any license that the faculty member would sign to redistribute copies of the paper. Uh, but all you have to do to opt out is fill out a one-page form and say, uh, here's the title of my paper. You don't have to give a reason. Say, I'm opting out. So if you've written a paper on art history that has lots of images from the 60s, which you can't redistribute, um, then you don't have to, to publish. And then your tenure committee can make that decision. That's my strong bias is, is to change the default rules. Um, and I spend a lot of time in Washington as a result. You know, it, that particular clause of the Creative Commons licenses has not been um, tried in court. Um, the effectiveness of such clauses has been established through the GPL and software. So we think there's pretty strong precedent for that. The CC licenses have been tested in court a couple of times, but it was uh, in both, the, the bit, two of the cases were in Europe and they had to do with non-commercial. One was like a, a, a pub that was playing CC non-commercial music. One was pictures of Adam Curry, if you're of a certain age. I remember he was a VJ in the 80s back when MTV played videos. Um, and he had posted pictures of his family under a non-commercial license to uh, his Flickr stream. And a tabloid ran them. And he successfully sued them for infringement. Uh, there was a case involving neighboring rights where Virgin Mobile used some Flickr pictures um, in, a, in, a, in an ad campaign, but they used one of a minor. Uh, and the phrasing on it implied that she didn't have any friends. And so she got upset and sued because her publicity rights had been violated because those are separate from the copyright license. Uh, but CC was dis C the CC part of that was dismissed very quickly by the judge. Um, and those are the main cases where, we, where the licenses have been tested. Uh, there was a big case involving, um, I believe it was the free art license, uh, which, which tested the concept of, of free licenses generally whether or not they were contracts or licenses, and the CC licenses were featured prominently in the opinion. Uh, but one thing that, that you see is, for the most part, these, these licenses are norms as much as they're, they're legally enforceable, but in many ways they're norms. And so the sorts of people who, who don't want to share alike don't tend to use things that are under share alike. Uh, they have systems in place that insulate them from ever touching something that has a copyleft component to make sure they don't accidentally trigger anything. It's certainly that's the way it is for software. Um, and one of the reasons we implement the licenses in metadata is to allow you to look for things that uh, have the terms and conditions that you're willing to accept. So you can go to Flickr and say, show me all the photographs, but I only want to see the ones that are under attribution. I don't want to deal with non-commercial. I don't want to deal with share alike. I don't want to deal with no derivatives. Uh, I only want photographs that I can resell, fold, spindle, mutilate, as long as I give attribution. Uh, and there's about 50 million of those, so that's a pretty good universe. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, there's so much uh, personal information. I mean, the, the internet runs on personal information. Right? That's why so many things are free, because we're the product. Right? Data about us is the product. It allows for precise, targeted advertising. Uh, and we give it away every day. I mean, you'd be stunned if you knew what the cookies in your computer tracked and sent to centralized systems. Um, stunned, right? And um, it's very, I, I think in many ways the way we think about genomic information is archaic and, and paternalistic. Um, certainly the physician's industry doesn't want you to know what's in your genome because you might do something about it. That was basically the gist of their testimony to the FDA a couple of weeks ago is, you know, it's sort of like in Dr. Strange, I was like, well, they'll, they'll see the big board, right? You know, and they'll know what to do. But I think that um, people are going to start to realize, A, the value of their non-health information and start to take some control over it. Um, second, and the Do Not Track uh, campaign that's emerging out of Berkman, actually, is, and Epic and some of these other places, I think, is, is going to be one of the leaders of that. Um, second is that... Um, people will realize that they can participate in research in lots of ways. They can install apps on their smartphone that track temperature. They can install things through the plug, a USB port on their smartphone uh, that they can take to their kid's school and test for mold, right? 
then correlate that to asthma outbreaks. These things are already happening. I'm not sort of spitballing. And, um, and that will have privacy implications. And then third is your actual your health data, which is in many ways the most personal uh, and the scariest, as well as the highest value. Um, but I, I tend to buy into um, a theory of, of that there's going to become a marketplace for privacy, uh, for personal information. I think that markets are more likely to solve the problem than just about anything else, uh, but it will need to be a well-regulated market. And my preference is that it gets regulated through good standards, right, that are commonly agreed to uh, in much the same way that even, if, even though Microsoft really wanted to screw with the internet itself in the 90s, it couldn't. Because if they had screwed with it, they weren't on the internet anymore. Because it was the standard. Right? It was this voluntary open monopoly that forced everyone to behave in a standard-based way. And, and my hope is that we can generate something akin to that in the health privacy space in the short term. Uh, and then over time, maybe the government can catch up and encode some of that stuff into a default system. Um, I'm not optimistic about the current climate in Washington leading to good legislative or regulatory action in the next couple of years. Um, but I think that there are signs that if we can generate some bootstrap systems that operate, that function, that the government might be willing to encode some of those into their own systems after they were demonstrated to work in the private sector. That seems to be able to get through both groups. Right, well, th this is, you know, um, I get into this argument all the time with the open science community. They're like, well, just get it on the web and it'll be fine. Um, you know, the first email is lost to the sands of time, and that's only a few decades ago, right? The scholarly record in chemistry, you need to go back 100 years often, right? Um, storing things on acid-free paper in correctly controlled environments is a remarkably effective way of preserving them. And there's been... Um, but you now have a lot of more digital... Oh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. I mean, I think this is one of the most important areas of research that we have to do. I mean, so I, I think of the, the two Ps that keep me up at night are preservation and provenance, um, which is that we, so we sort of know from a citation who wrote something and when, and vaguely whether or not we can trust it. Um, in a born digital context, in the world where, like that open network biology journal that I helped start, right, might well be Pandora's box, right? Uh, which version of the software model are you citing? What if someone else came and found a bug in it and you fixed it? How do you how do you preserve that feedback loop and cite the correct version of the model? Um, the operating system on which that model was created, right? The physical hardware on which that operating system ran. I mean. It's, it's fractally complicated to preserve these things, and it's fractally complicated to, to get the provenance right on them. Um, but I think that is why library science is, is going to be a pretty exciting field to work in, uh, because no one else wants to answer that question. Right? No chemist wants to deal with the answer to that. None of the, my bio friends who are doing these genetic models want to, want to have a conversation about pr preservation or provenance. Um, we've done a really bad job as a community, and I include myself in that, selling this to the sorts of people who fund museums. You know I mean, they, there's these gala dinners that raise $100 million for a museum, right, you know, in New York. We can't scrape together $50,000 for a pilot project on preservation. So we've, we've got to get a better argument as a group. Um, We've got to get a better argument about provenance and being able to explain why it's important. Um, and ideally, we've got to find a, a hero somewhere in the funding community that's willing to fund some exploratory research in this space. Because as of yet, I, I don't see any place to try it except the library community. Uh, and I haven't seen funders lining up to do it. There may be a couple that are showing up. There's some nice progressive program officers being named at some nice friendly foundations and hopefully things will, will get better. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I would start with metadata exists. Uh, metadata is important. I think unfortunately you have to sort of start there. Um, I think the, the idea that, that you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of the cure, right? I, in much the same way that um, 
that you're required to take statistics, even if you're in the social sciences, that, that you're required to have some basic statistical literacy. I think that it should be a component of the curriculum that you understand basic curation of information. Um, and that anyone who's going to be a graduate student, right, and maybe even part of the undergraduate curriculum. Um, and I would think that that would actually be an argument that you could use in attracting faculty members is that you're a lot more likely to have students who create the sort of data that gets more widely used that gets you more citations because we make this part of the core curriculum of being a graduate student at, at a university. Um, I would love to see the course that you've created open sourced as an open educational resource. Right? Um, let's make the UCLA method the standard way in much the same way we have you know, the Chicago Book of Style. Right? You know, that, that book didn't exist until somebody published it as a way to do citations. And so I think there's a hole in the market, if you will, for a methodology of how to teach this. Um, and that being the place that promulgates that is actually a recruiting dangle that you could put out. But uh, so I don't, have, I don't have a quick answer, but it would be I, th I think that every graduate student should have to take at least a six to 12 week course on basics of curation. Um, second to that, I think that every library that is serious about this should have uh, a more in-depth training for their staff so that part of what you learn in your six-week or your 12-week course as a graduate student is where to go in the library to ask questions. Uh, and that positions the library as a service provider that's pretty hard to defund uh, just because you don't need as many shelves, which is sort of the, the, the easy argument, especially at land-grant universities. Um, so Tim Hubbard, who's at the Sanger Center in the UK, he's one of the, the guys who wrote the Bermuda Rules that, that kept the genome open, um, gave a talk years ago at the first Science Commons Symposium we put together, I don't think you were there, at the National Academies, and it was on learning what to forget in a digital age. And this is in, um, I forget the name of the book that I read that Christine recommended to me, um, which has a whole chapter on, again, knowing what to forget. And um, in the sciences, I think th this is the sort of thing that you would want to teach a little more discipline specific if you did one of these courses, right? So you would say, you know, six weeks generic practice on curation and six weeks on biology, which is if the, if the machine you're making it on has already been replaced by a better one but we haven't bought it yet, you don't have to keep the raw file because we can recreate that data, right? Did you use a sample that was unique and consumable? We better keep that. Right? If you took a blood sample from somebody that you're never going to see again, keep the data. Right? If you took it from someone you're going to see tomorrow, keep a processed version of the data. Right? Uh, did you consume an ice core sample from 1955 in Antarctica? You absolutely have to keep that data because that, it's, that sample's gone when you're done. You've transformed it into data. It's sort of like uh, when you're taking these old you know, eight track or reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes and you only have one shot to digitize them. You damn sure better make sure that the digital version is annotated and preserved. Um, but these are, these are processes that, you know, they're going to take a while to figure out. You know, we've had books for a long time. We've had journals since 1665. It's, we've had a lot of time socially to integrate them. Um, we haven't really had big digital data for very long. And, and we just don't know. Right. Right, and a lot of the assumptions that people make around open data are formed by the success of open source software. So I said, and crappy open source software gets better over time because people fix it. Right, that's Apache. The name of the web server literally is is because of the word Apache web server because they had to patch it so often. Right. <laughs> right, but bad data, yeah. bad measurements can't be patched. They can't be made better. Right? You can add annotations and processes that defeat some of the flaws in that. Right? And you can only do that if you know what's wrong with the data. If you can say, actually, you know, we found out later that somebody spit in this machine, right? or that there was an eyelash in the microarray that day. Right? You can defeat some of those things algorithmically. But the data itself doesn't get better through incremental innovation. So, you know, not only do you, does it not survive benign neglect, you've got to actively preserve it or its half-life is, is very fleeting. You've got to aggressively describe it so that someone else can use it. 
and it's not going to get better through lots of people looking at it. Right? You might find lots of uses for it if a lot of people look at it. Right? That's the thing, is that in software with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. But with data, many eyes means that you might find a million uses for it. But you won't be able to go in and fix the underlying bugs in old measurements. So I think you know, being able to understand when you generated the data how useful it might be or how rare it might be, how regenerable it is, you know, might need to be one of those pieces. But that's going to be different in anthropology and archaeology than it is in high energy physics, than it is in astronomy, than it is in biology. So I'm going to repeat the question so that my answer seems less stupid. Um, <laughs> The question is, as we get electronic and personal health records, how do you preserve the data over the lifespan of the organism 80, 90 years? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I tend to think that the people that are going to do that are going to be the insurance companies uh, because they have a financial incentive to get that figured out because then they can amortize their risk effectively. Um, the question is, how do you work with the insurance industry in a well-regulated market to make sure that that information is available for health purposes and for personal enrichment purposes. Not in the monetary sense of enrichment, but to understand your own health and to understand your own life, to be able to reinvest your data that was collected for actuarial purposes into a research project. Um, but you know, as, as it gets trivial to collect this information, right? so right now I can't really get my health record from my doctor. Uh, I, I take cell phone photographs of my records whenever I leave the office. That's how I currently get my health records uh, from my doctor. But there's a legislative mandate under the High Tech Act, which just passed, that within three years, hospitals and doctors have 72 hours to return a digital health record to you. Right? It's going to be a requirement. Now, what you're going to be allowed to do with that is anybody's, is anybody's notice. And I can see a ripe market for hackers to post sniffers outside the doors of doctors. Uh, and sniff RFIDs as people walk out with their health records on a chip. Right? If, I was, if I was a jerk, that would be a business I would be in, right? Because <laughs> um, these RFIDs are terrible. They're easy to crack, right? Um, and so I think counting on individuals to, to sort of do that is probably not rational. Uh, but if we can have a standards-based way so that the various institutions and corporations that have an interest in them can do that in a way that's interoperable, then it's okay. I mean, it also depends on what culture you're in. If you're in the Mormon church, the Mormon church is going to probably be a repository of that for the people who are members. I mean, I'm not a member, but the genealogy work that they've done is spectacular. Uh, I can certainly see them extending that to, to health data for their members if, if, if the members de demand it. Um, other institutions that you belong to over a long period of time, your university may offer that as, a, as an alumni service. Here's a data locker. You know, it's, we have no idea where this is really all going to go. Uh, we just know, the, the important thing is to know that we don't have any idea and to not foreclose the sorts of innovations that would allow a church or a university to compete with Aetna. Right? What I don't want is a world in which Aetna builds the network right? and only Aetna can use the network. That's the point. Because the, the answer is very, is very unlikely to be any of the ones that I rattled off. Right? I would, in 1966, I probably would not have predicted the internet. Right? I'm, I'm the guy who shows up 10 minutes late for the party. Right? Um, but the answer will most likely come from a system where 1,000 people can take a shot at it. Right? So that if there's 999 failures, that's actually a feature of the system as opposed to a bug. Right. Yeah, we don't really, from a data perspective, we don't have a healthcare system. We have a payment system. Uh, we have a reimbursement system. And, um, but that, that's, uh, that's going to change. You know, the, um, the advent of, of personal health records is, is, is coming. It's messy right now. You know, the, uh, the Obama administration uh, has put together this thing called the blue button, which lets veterans download a very messy text file that is theoretically their health record. Um, someone's going to come up with a script that cleans that up and standardizes it uh, because it's open. Um, the impact of the High Tech Act over three years is going to be, I think, pretty transformative. Um, there will, services are going to emerge. Uh, my hope is that those services have competition and are forced to adhere to a common set of open standards as opposed to uh, trying to become Facebook and basically say, we're going to build a walled garden so big that no one notices the walls which is 
unfortunately, that's like the most common business model in Silicon Valley right now, and it's the one everyone wants to imitate, which is, you know, we're going to have an open API, but we can turn it off whenever we want. We're going to encourage developers to do stuff inside our world, but not allow any communication with the outside world. And that's where investors are going, because there's this sort of recoil. And if, if Zitrain was here last week, right, Zitrain, this is, the, this is the inevitable backlash of a generative system, which is that it creates so much innovation, but it also allows for chaos and allows for exploitation. And um, the argument that I'm making is that we have to basically swallow it and say, you know what? When it comes to data, we, we're so far away from either spam and phishing or generativity that we don't have any choice but an open system. But it may well be that we'll have some of these, these estuary phases where there, there's some benefit that's gained from being in these closed systems, but it becomes, it becomes very evident after five or 10 years that they can't scale. Uh, and we will have lost five or 10 years, but then at that point people will actually you know, sort of shut up and adopt the open standards. That may well be what happens. And that, you know, that's not the worst of all possible worlds because at least some people will get benefit along the way and it will demonstrate the power of the open system over time. Because you know, just as the generative system is going to get overwhelmed with attack, right, the closed system will, cripple, will basically be crippled under its own weight because it can't do all the things, it, it can't hire enough people to do all the things that need to be done. So I, I'm not apocalyptic about this if it doesn't happen right away. Right, so that's a great point, and that was sort of the, that was the goal for us was to actually learn. There was a lot of talk about using semantic web to integrate databases, but nobody was doing it at, at a high at, a, at scale. Right, people would do like a pilot and then write a paper and move on, or they would do a pilot and do a demo and get a consulting deal with a pharmaceutical company uh, and move on. And we wanted to build something that actually stuck around. So um, the way that we did it was for every. For every given data source that we looked at, um, we, we looked at the data model of the database, and we mapped it to standard terms in existing ontologies. And we looked uh, mainly through the open biomedical ontologies, or OBO. Um, OBO is a list of over 100 open ontologies. So wherever possible, we mapped entities in database models to terms in existing open ontologies. Um, when that wasn't possible, we, we actually have our own sort of glue code ontology called the Science Commons ontology, but that's mainly for things like is similar to sort of verbs, not nouns. But the vast majority of the entities, we were able to map noun to noun to something else. Um, then you write a script, right, that, that basically it's like, a, it's like a, a little script that you run the database through, right, the day you pass all of the contents of the database through the script and it spits out RDF, right, representations of the database which then can be stitched together with the RDF representations of every other database that we've done this to, because we're doing it all in an integrated set of namespaces and using the same set of ontologies. Uh, and then we had to write the software that actually does the assembly of the graph. And then we had to fix the open source uh, triple store to make it efficient enough to actually build the system and let you run queries. And then, um, then we gave it away. Um, this is basically, the reason that we knew how to do this is that I hired two guys from Millennium Pharmaceuticals who had done the same thing at Millennium uh, and had done it the way they felt was not the right way because the standards weren't ready. So they basically rebuilt that system but in the public sphere using the standard technologies. Um, we do know that there's at least 15 or 20 clones out in the wild. We know that a couple of them are inside pharmaceutical companies. Uh, because we didn't have the right to redistribute all of the underlying data sources, we redistributed the scripts and the building instructions. So since we couldn't say, you know, we, we actually do have one whole cartridge, which is you can just in two hours build your own copy of it by loading this onto your hard drive. But you can't do that if you work at a company because some of the sources had non-commercial restrictions on it. Uh, but you can build your own using the instructions that we've got. And the idea was um, that anyone coming up with a new database could just mail us a script for their database and a link to their database and we could patch the distribution and, and add it. Uh, nobody did that though, right? Um, lots of people are happy to use the stuff that we wrote, but if people are patching their own data in, they're not telling us. Uh, but what we did find is that after we built it, everyone from Northrop Grumman to Mass General Hospital called us to say, will you write scripts for data that we need to, to be able to query in this way? 
So there's, there's some demand for it, but I think there's, there would be real value in building a pedagogy that says, here is how you do this. And you know, computers are getting faster every 18 months, as we know. Storage is getting cheaper. The tooling for Semantic Web is so much better than it was six years ago when we started the project that it, if we did it now, it would probably take two people one year. Simply because you know, the, the toolkits and the speed uh, are better and the knowledge. Like we, six months of this was arguing with people over methodology on mailing lists at the web consortium because there were real debates over you know, how rigid you should be in the creation of a standard name for a database entity. Right? Should it be semantically opaque, which is what we argued for, or should it have a semantic meaning baked into the name? Right? Uh, ontological realism versus non-realism occupied like six months of people's time and phone calls and wrangling. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, it'll drive you to drink. Um, but a lot of those arguments are over because there's running code now that bakes in our perspective and it works. And so you can either agree with us and use our system, or you can disagree with us and build your own, or you can take our code and fork it and disagree with us. But most people don't have the time, the effort, and the inclination to do that. So putting out running code is a really good way to win those sorts of arguments. Um, but I would love, if you guys are ever interested in building a pedagogy, you know, Jonathan Reese and Alan Ruttenberg and all of these guys who basically were part of the people that built Lisp at MIT are the, are the guys who did this. And they would love nothing more than to propagate their methodology. I can tell you that. Thanks.